I'd like to welcome you to this edition of the PRS Journal Club podcast with your hosts, Dr. Sammy Sino, Amanda Silva, and Raj Shah Martinez. Enjoy. Hello, and welcome to the 12th installment of the PRS Journal Club in this inaugural endeavor from the Plastic and Reconstructive Surgery Journal. My name is Raj Shah Martinez, and I'm joined by my fellow resident ambassadors, Amanda Silva and Sammy Sino, for our last podcast of the year. This month, we are privileged to be joined by Dr. Rod Rorick, the legendary founding chairman of the Department of Plastic Surgery at UG Southwestern and editor-in-chief of the acclaimed Plastic and Reconstructive Surgery Journal and PRS Global Open. Dr. Rorick, thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to join us for this, our 12th month anniversary of the PRS Journal Club. It's my pleasure and honor to be here, Raj, and great year and great work here. Thanks so much, and we're all really excited to hand over the podcast and the reins here over to the upcoming Paris resident ambassadors, Shuja, Jordan, and Chad, and we wish them all good luck as they uh, seek their next endeavors. In this current discussion, uh, we'll be focusing in on a meta-analysis by Wang et al. from UCSF, evaluating the use of prolonged prophylactic antibiotics and whether or not they reduce the incidence of surgical site infections in immediate prosthetic breast reconstruction. The author searched publishing databases and compared antibiotics given for less than 24 hours compared to them given greater than 24 hours in cases of immediate prosthetic breast reconstruction, the primary outcomes of surgical site infections and implant loss being monitored. The authors then evaluated the pooled relative risk estimates for these data. From the review, they identified four cohort studies and one randomized controlled trial that met the study's inclusion criteria out of a search from 1974 to 2015 from the Medline, Embase, and Cochrane Library databases. The authors identified a total of 927 individual studies, but only the five mentioned fully met their inclusion criteria, which really was pretty stringent and focused in on second studies administered antibiotics on a protocol or routine basis instead of allowing for surgeon preferences. The others found an unadjusted surgical site infection incidence of 14% for antibiotics given greater than 24 hours, 19% when antibiotics were given for less than 24 hours. They also found an unadjusted rate of implant loss of 8% when antibiotics were given for greater than 24 hours and 10% when they were given for less than 24 hours. The pooled relative risk for these two parameters with antibiotics given less than 24 hours was not statistically significant. As with all studies, the devil is in the details, and although this data does represent an excellent analysis of the pooled numbers from well-carried out experiments, there are several uh, confounders that the authors attribute as well. In the five reference studies, the authors note that there's variability and potential bias in the studies as they vary in their design, patient cohorts, the procedures that they actually included, the outcomes and how they were defined, and then their reporting. There's also some variability in the rates of use of acellular dermal matrices, the radiation histories, follow-up times, and the use of antibiotic irrigation. The authors concluded, however, that these pooled results did not demonstrate a statistically significant difference in the surgical site infections or implant loss with greater than 24 hours of antibiotics. You know, in my opinion, I think this review is very thorough, well-executed, and it's a great consolidation of the existing literature that's really a complex, multifactorial field and they really examined in a very thorough manner the breast reconstruction and prophylactic antibiotic use. As the authors point out, and really in their conclusions, they stated the best way to truly control for all these confounders are through multi-center perspective randomized controlled clinical trials, which two of which are currently ongoing. Ultimately, I think this is another important manuscript based on the complexity and the controversies that are really surrounding us all with using prolonged antibiotics in multiple fields, but here specifically in prosthetic breast reconstruction. Dr. Roark, you've seen you know, all these trials and all these studies now over the years. Do you think it's a matter of time before it becomes a gold standard recommendation that we just totally cut out prolonged antibiotics and only do perioperative antibiotics for prosthetic-based reconstruction? Well... I think it's long overdue. I think this study adds to the ongoing literature in the peer-reviewed literature that using antibiotics outside that 24-hour period really is not indicated and is probably contraindicated as it's cited in breast reconstruction because certainly in elective clean surgery, if you don't have an operative level of your antibiotic going by the time you're operating within that hour or 
preoperatively, there is no data to support you using it beyond 24 hours after the procedure. And this study certainly goes on to actually confirm that in the specific area of prosthetic breast reconstruction. The sad thing is that they had to review 927 studies and only found four cohorts. That's amazing. And, you know, one randomized controlled trial. You know, I think it's a good confirmatory study, and I applaud them for doing this arduous work. I know that I don't use perioperative antibiotics based upon the literature for breast reconstruction or any type of uh, elective or non-elective surgery unless I have an indication of an impending or an ongoing infection. And there is absolutely no data to support using it beyond that. In fact, if anything, if you talk to our infectious disease colleagues, they are very, very much against you doing that. And I know that in plastic surgery, there are still these bastions where people continue to use antibiotics if the drains are in, but there's no data to support that. And this confirms that. Absolutely. And, and just the devil advocate a bit, I think certain people would argue or would say, you know, these are patients then get radiation, will have the acellular momentum in the foreign body. Is the counter to those arguments really that there's always going to be a percentage of infection that will happen no matter what. And because of that, we sort of have to accept that number and, and treat the infections as they arise. I mean, I think the authors here make an argument that you know, the groups that did not use prolonged antibiotics, the bacteria that were present were less virulent. They were not really skewing to that. Is that what we need to get to, a culture of accepting a percentage of infection, you think? I really do, and I think if you talk to our infectious disease colleagues, and I've had many of these discussions, is that that's exactly what they say, is that if you're using antibiotics blindly more than the 24-hour perioperative period, you are super selecting out potentially highly resistant bacterial strains which actually do not serve us well or the patient well. I'm a strong believer in perioperative antibiotics only in 24 hours max, or at the very least, if you have antibiotics going at least an hour before you start your procedure, you don't need perioperative antibiotics beyond 24 hours or even to the 24-hour period. There is very good data to support that. This is confirmatory data and obviously in a selected group in prosthetic breast reconstruction. So that's why I, uh, I thought this was very good to publish because we'd like to nail the coffin on the use of prolonged antibiotics. Not only is it not prudent, but I really think it can be potentially harmful to our patients. Even though there may not be evidence for prolonged antibiotics. Many people at many institutions still use them. What do you think needs to be done to convince people to not use prolonged antibiotics anymore? First of all, they need to read these studies. You know, the level of evidence is powerful, whether doing a systematic review or cohort study, that that power in evidence-based medicine supersedes the, oh, I did 3,000 patients and I put them all on antibiotics. And I just think we need to believe in the power of evidence-based medicine. Why do you think that we shifted the entire journal to evidence-based medicine pyramids over six years ago? Because we felt the strong need to get out from being experts to being evidence-based. We are an expert-based specialty, but we must become an evidence-based specialty. And this is a hallmark of why we need to do so. It's an ongoing battle we have, and this is just one of them. But I think this is the one that is... To me, in reading the literature, way beyond plastic surgery is something that has a lot of good science behind it. It's just funny to think, you know, we'll, we'll be sitting in the call room and it's 2016 and we'll be talking about which attendings want antibiotics with drains to go home, which don't. And, and you kind of just scratch your head and say, my goodness, I mean, with all of the resources we have, Maybe, you know, Dr. Smitani is a prolific author and very curious investigator. Maybe there just needs to be one final multi-center prospective study randomized that just puts the final nail in the coffin and answers the question definitively. It would be great if you could get some great centers of which all of you have, are from, maybe a 10, you know, institutions around the country that could, you know, you could easily get thousands of breast reconstruction patients in a year but that would take money, and this would be an ideal one to do from the Plastic Surgery Foundation. This would be phenomenal, one of those things that really needs to be done. Absolutely. Well, thank you guys so much for an excellent discussion. Thank you, Dr. Rourke, again, and thanks, everyone, for listening.